Hello, Beth Kaplan. Thank you so much for being with us today. So would you be so kind to tell us a little bit about the life of uh, Jacob Gordon from when he was in Russia to when he arrived in America? So he had been a Russian Jewish newspaper editor and writer. He'd done many things, but he was the leader of a cult a kind of back-to-the-land group called the Spiritual Biblical Brotherhood. And the group was outlawed by the Tsarist authorities in 1891, and he had to flee. So he went to America, leaving behind eight children, including my grandmother, who was not quite two, and his wife, who was eight months pregnant with their ninth child. So he landed at the end of July, 1891, and what he discovered on the Lower East Side was Yiddish newspapers. Um, there were so many immigrants from all over Eastern Europe who were extremely eager to read about home and also to learn about this new country, and the only language they had in common was Yiddish. So Yiddish newspapers were springing up everywhere, and so Jacob Gordon began to write immediately practically the day he landed for the Yiddish newspapers. Wow, and then when did he start from there to write plays? So what happened uh, is that one of the very first articles that he wrote was a dialogue. It was written in dialogue, and one of the actors of the Yiddish stage, Mogilescu, uh, read it and immediately adapted it for the stage because th there was already dialogue. And so Gordon came to the attention of the actors of the Yiddish theater, especially Jacob Adler who was a magnificent man, one of the great stars of the Yiddish stage at that time. And the thing about Adler was that he wasn't very good at singing and dancing the way Tomaszewski was and Mogulescu was. So he wanted a play that was heavy and weighty and tragic. And he asked Gordon to write him a play. And Gordon, who'd never written for the theater, never written in Yiddish, agreed to write a play for Adler because he wanted to teach the audiences and the actors about the very serious theater of realism. The Yiddish theater was only 15 years old at that time. Until 1876, Jews had no theater at all. So it was very young, it was very improvisational, it was, you know, people were talking to the stage and the actors were talking to each other and it was very undisciplined with lots of singing and dancing and comedy and Gordon wanted to create a different serious kind of theater. And so he wrote a play for Adler in one week, a four-act play, and that's how he began writing for the Yiddish theater. Wow, and um, so we can say in a way that uh, the Yiddish King Lear uh, changed the way uh, Yiddish theater was uh, made and was uh, produced because, as you yes. said, it was a little bit like a vaudeville in a way, very folkloric, and he changed that. But how the play, the Yiddish King Lear itself, yes. came together and how was he uh, acquainted with this theme of the King Lear? Was he a fan of Shakespeare? Was that? Oh, yes. Well, he had lived in Odessa for a long time and he went to the theater there. He was a theater critic himself for a while. So he certainly, and he was a very well-read man. He had hundreds and thousands of books in his library. So he had read King Lear. He certainly knew about Shakespeare. And so it was a year after he had written the first play for Adler. He had a few that were not so good. And then in October, October of 1892, he brought Adler this play called The Jewish King Lear, which he had adapted from King Lear, but he had made it relevant for the Jewish audiences of the Lower East Side. He'd made the Lear character a Russian Jewish merchant with daughters. And of course, really what he was doing was talking not just about the theater of realism, but about feminism, which was absolutely revolutionary for his time. The Cordelia character wants to be a doctor. She wants to go to St. Petersburg. You know, Jewish girls did not do these things. So he was writing a feminist, revolutionary character. It was, you know, it really was groundbreaking. And how that play was perceived 
uh, when it opened? Was it an instant success or like all a lot of uh, the, the, the big successes that we know at opening night was always a disaster. So I'm always curious to know how yes. was it perceived by the audience, but also by the critics? Well, there's a story about the very first play the year before that Adler had to come out on stage after one of the curtains and beg the audience to be quiet and listen because they weren't used to serious theater without singing and dancing. And so he actually, with tears in his eyes, said, please listen, you know, listen to the words. And so they did. But the audience was used to a light theater, singing, dancing, comedy. But um, by the time the Jewish King Lear came out, they were they knew there was a new kind of theater happening. And that night, Adler was so brilliant that apparently the moment the curtain rose and people saw him as the merchant, dressed as the merchant at a long table with his daughters and his friends, apparently from that moment, the character took the play was an enormous success. It was the first great hit of the Yiddish theater, and it's the beginning of the golden age of the Yiddish theater. Because there is a very big gray area uh, after um, Gordon's death of how many times this play was revived, was it played a lot. So what is, to your knowledge, how many productions uh, were made uh, until now? I really don't know. I know that there was a movie made of it. There were movies made of several of Gordon's plays, uh, largely in the 30s. Um, and uh, it's not as popular as Mirala Ephros, which was a play that he wrote a few years later, which is subtitled The Jewish Queen Lear. And that is a play that has continued to be played in Montreal and in Tel Aviv and in New York just recently. So um, the, the Jewish King Lear didn't have that kind of success, but I know it has had productions through the years, particularly during the Depression, when you know Roosevelt gave money to theater companies, and one of them was to a Yiddish troupe, and they t toured the United States during the Depression with the Jewish King Lear. And I, I thought it must have meant a great deal to people who had so little to see a man lose everything and then get it all back again at the end. How did you start your, your research? Because you obviously never met Jacob Gordon himself, but uh, like, how your passion for him, because, you know, there are also other grand, great daughters, etc. But yes. how your passion came to it yes. and also how uh, this desire to do the book came together. So, uh, yes, I didn't know Jacob Gordon. He died in 1909, which was quite a long time before I was born. Um, I grew up in Canada. My father's name was Jacob Gordon Kaplan. And uh, he was a scientist, but he was unable to work in the United States because of Joseph McCarthy. My father was a socialist. He was a social activist and a peacenik. So we moved to Canada when I was a baby, and I, and I grew up in Canada. But every summer, we would visit my grandmother, and she would take me into the hall and show me the bust of her father. It was a huge bronze bust of Jacob Gordon in the foyer of her apartment. And so I was fascinated by this man particularly because I grew up to be an actress, so I spent my 20s in the theater. And then when I was 30, I left to take a master's degree in creative writing and decided that my thesis would be a book about my great-grandfather. So I started, and you know, it meant coming to New York, where I discovered that almost everything about him was in Yiddish, and I, I don't speak Yiddish. I thought I would not be able to write this book, and I was lucky enough to meet a woman called Sarah Torchinsky, who was very interested in my work, and she translated everything in Yiddish for 25 years. Do, do you think, first of all, that uh, Gordon gets or got or should be getting more now the success that his talent deserves? Because he really changed uh, the way we do not just theater, Yiddish theater, but regular theater. Do you think that he should get more yeah. publicity? Well, you know that uh, Adler was his great, Jacob Adler was his great colleague, and Adler went on to have many children who all became actors, including the famous actor Stella, um, Stella Adler, who was one of the founders of the group theater and was 
the discoverer, for example, of Marlon Brando. And Marlon Brando once said, if there weren't a Yiddish theater, there wouldn't have been a Stella. And if there weren't a Stella, there wouldn't have been all of these amazing American actors that she trained, like him. So, you know, that tradition of meaningful, serious, weighty theater that is very relevant to the audience, to me, that has never gone out of style. To me, it's very important. I do know that he's not Shakespeare. He, he, you know, he was a, a magnificent man and a writer for his time and place. He was working with a, a group of people who had never known the theater, so he did an enormous job. Yeah. And I do hope that people will come to know about him because his is a magnificent story. But that's definitely a book that one needs to read. This is uh, uh, for sure. And what, what, what I felt um, when, I, when, when I did the play was really to... Uh, feel the basics almost of American culture and American comedy, you know, with the character of Tritle. So do you think that he was influenced by the, uh, uh, the American style and no. the Jews in America, or it was pure Russian thing? Pure Russian. Oh, yeah. He really was not happy to live in America until he took a trip uh, after he'd been in America for some time, he went back to Eastern Europe. And when he came back to America, he said, I am so grateful to live in this country with its schools and its hospitals and its police force. And at that point, he became an American citizen. But that was two years before he died. So it took him a long time to really feel welcome and, and comfortable in this country. Wow, so, and to be, before we start to say goodbye to each other, um, on, on your book, you uh, get a lot of, uh, of uh, documents and a lot of uh, very precise uh, things. So I believe you used some, you, you went to look in the archives of Evo, uh, I understood. And w how was this research started? Were there some archives from your family also? Or it was, tell us yes, about that. Yes, I have things like I have his cane, I have a pen of his. When Are you I, selling the cane to I me? I am not, no. <laughs> I gave his books, I inherited many of his books, and I gave them to the National Yiddish Book Center. Um, but I, when I started my research, I was not only at the YIVO, of course, which was invaluable, but I discovered that his youngest daughter was still alive. She was 86 and living in Queens, so I went to visit her many times, and his first granddaughter was still alive, 96, and nearly blind and deaf, but so happy to tell me her stories. So I got these fantastic stories straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, as well as all the information from the evil. Well, Beth, I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming all the way from Toronto to New York to this beautiful place at the Angel Orange Chance Foundation. It it's, it's and I want to say that your book was extremely helpful to understand the character of uh, Gordon and to understand his music in a way, even though he didn't want music and all this stuff. But for me, there is so much music in, in his writing. And, and I think the title, Finding the Jewish Shakespeare, is absolutely perfect because it's kind of an enigma in a way you know and and all yes. the work you did is absolutely wonderful no, so i really believe that this should be a hollywood film about the life of gordon i tell you that i have a friend who's a, a screenwriter whose agent is the same agent as steven spielberg so i did try to get the book to but, Steven Spielberg, because I think he should make the movie. He should make the movie, so definitely. Crossed, yeah, no, no. We, we, we want him to do it. Uh, he is not coming tonight to see the show, unfortunately. But definitely, he. this is a book that everyone must read because it teaches us about the history of America, but also all these people who brought the culture, and this is what America is about. My dear Beth, thank you a million times. A great pleasure.